Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our 5 Minute Histories videos. And today I'm downtown, we're going to talk about the building behind me, the Civic Center, or the Baltimore Arena, or the First Mariner Arena, or the Royal Farms Arena, or as my kids today call it, the Chicken Box. But no matter what you call it, it's had a pretty storied history. Um, it's 50 years old, its cornerstone was laid in 1961, and it's had a lot of stuff happening uh, inside of its walls here. Now, if you're following along more or less real time, you know that we are heading towards the end of the year, just a few days before New Year's Eve. Maybe you have New Year's Eve plans, maybe you had them and then canceled them. But if we turn back the clock and it was 1966 in the holiday season, you might have been here on Baltimore Street waiting in line to see the Beach Boys. Or if it were 1969, you would have been inside screaming your head off to Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. Um, in 1978, you, in the holiday season, you could have been here uh, for Eric Clapton. In 1981, you could have been here for the Beach Boys again. Apparently, they like the arena. In 2010, those of you with a little bit of a harder rock bet would have been inside uh, for Ozzy Osbourne. And just a few holiday seasons ago, you might have been here for the Smashing Pumpkins. But we are not going to start our story with the Smashing Pumpkins. We're going to start our story with the Second Continental Congress. Back in 1776, we had declared our independence from Great Britain, and they weren't so happy. We were at war, and our national legislature was meeting in Philadelphia. But it was under threat with the British uh, closing in on it. So our wily legislators said, well, why don't we leave and move to Baltimore? So for two months in the winter of 1776 and 1777, um, Baltimore became the nation's capital. And they chose to meet at maybe the finest place in the city something called the Henry Fight House. I mean, it was pretty grand. It was made of brick. That was special. It had 14 rooms. It had a stables that could accommodate 30 horses. And maybe best of all for the Congress, it had a cellar that ran the entire length of the building and was full of wine. So that kept them going for the two months. And in fact, uh, during those two months, the building changed names and it was called Congress Hall. There's a plaque inside uh, the Royal Farms Arena today commemorating its time as Congress Hall, uh, put there in 1894. Um, after Congress Hall, it went back to the Fight family. They owned it for a number of years. But in the 1820s and 1830s, one of Baltimore's most prominent citizens called the building his home and office, and that was George Peabody, um, the philanthropist, um, who was at that point becoming a financier. He lived here before he moved to New York and then London, essentially becoming America's uh, international financier, bringing the world's wealth to America through London banks. Um, today, of course, we know him for his philanthropy uh, uh, here in Baltimore for the Peabody Institute. If you were in London and said the name George Peabody, you might get the response that he's the fellow who started public housing in England. And he did that, in fact, too. Um, so what happened to the building? It is clearly not here today. Well, what happened was the 1904 fire. It started right here and uh, burned the building down um, with only the plaque uh, that was salvageable. Um, but let's fast forward to the 1950s, and we've got Baltimore's leaders worrying over and trying to plan for to save and uh, revitalize downtown Baltimore. They're planning Charles Center, and they know that they need a civic center as part of this package. The problem was where to put it, or the question was where to put it, that task fell to a young group called the Greater Baltimore Committee, and they were given nine options to, uh, for where the new Civic Center could go. Two were in Druid Hill Park. Um, uh, the Parks Commissioner was not keen on that, so that was out. One was in Clifton Park. Um, that was considered too far from downtown. Three were at the Inner Harbor, where the World Trade Center and the uh, Harbor Place is today. Um, but I suspect the Greater Baltimore Committee already had eyes uh, for different uses there. And so this place here in 1961 was selected with the cornerstone laid. Incidentally, inside the cornerstone is a time capsule with a message from President John F. Kennedy um, and uh, Maryland Governor Millard Tawes. So I uh, don't know what's in there. Maybe someday we'll find out. Um, so, uh, so things are going along really well. And, uh, and there's lots of stuff happening at the Civic Center. The first permanent residents uh, were a uh, group that was um, called the Baltimore Clippers. If you remember your hockey, they were from the American Hockey League. 
They played here from 1962 to 1976. Pretty soon joined by an NBA, a basketball team, the Baltimore Bullets, um, who played here until 1973. They eventually moved to D.C. and became the uh, Washington Bullets and then today's Washington Wizards. And then our indoor soccer team, the Baltimore Blast, played here up until uh, the 1980s or maybe even 90s. Um, and I believe their only championship year was here at, uh, in 1983. In addition to sports, uh, the Baltimore Civic Center has seen lots of important events happen. In 1966, Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, um, gave an important speech, uh, Race and the Church, while he was visiting here. In 1963, the Bolshoi Ballet performed here. And the building has uh, hosted everything from National Science Foundation um, championships um, to uh, Paps Blue Ribbon Beer Rodeos. Uh, and some of us rem may remember the elephants, the Ringling Brothers Circus Elephants, who we would go and watch eat pumpkins and all sorts of vegetables on the parking lot next to Lexington Market and then come down here to see the circus uh, later that afternoon. And then there are the concerts, lots and lots of concerts, way too many to even begin to uh, cover. But let's take a uh, look at a few. On September 13th, 1964, the Beatles played back-to-back -back shows here, um, uh, thrilling lots of fans. Um, afterwards, they partied at uh, the top of the Holiday Inn, the revolving restaurant called La Ronde. And here's what the Baltimore Sun had to say. They said the party started at 33 RPMs and swung at 78 with the Beatles' own hands across the sea drink, which, as every 14-year-old knows, is scotch and Coke mixed. Hmm, I'm not sure about that, but that's what they were drinking. In the 1970s, Led Zeppelin played here and backstage recorded uh, scenes, tape filmed scenes for its movie, The Song Remains the Same. And The Grateful Dead played here a number of times, including one time where they uh, recorded a song called The Other One for a record 40 minutes, one song. And then finally, Elvis Presley played here in 1977, uh, just a few weeks before he passed away. Over that time, the building's been reconfigured a number of times, maybe most significantly in 1986, um, to help boost the still new Inner Harbor. Um, that's where we got the uh, sort of lattice work and glass here uh, front on Baltimore Street. Um, and today, after about 10 years of uh, pondering what to do with the Civic Center Arena, um, Baltimore, which owns the building, Baltimore City, um, had been considering demolishing it and rebuilding it, either here or elsewhere. But they have just uh, a month or so ago given a contract to a firm led by NBA's Kevin Durant, um, um, who has pledged a $150 million redo here, uh, which hopefully would take the Civic Center uh, 50 years into the future. Who knows what Baltimoreans will be uh, lining up to see on holidays um, uh, at that time. All right, I'm going to wrap up and say I hope you all have a happy new year, and thank you one more time for making this year um, really great as we explored Baltimore's wonderful places and what makes our city such a great city. Thanks so much, and we'll see you in 2022.